All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 12th installment of uh, the Adventures in Field Research, Research Seminar Series. Um, we're super excited to have everyone here today. Uh, we are grateful for Dr. Christopher Paradise from Davidson University, uh, Davidson College, rather, um, joining us here today. He's got a little presentation for us with a couple stories called Local Adventures in the Field student-driven ecological research at a liberal arts college. Um, just as a reminder for you all to hold your questions until the end, um, we'll have a brief discussion period following the presentation. So uh, if you're like me, either write your questions down or put them in the chat. Uh, but with that being said, uh, Dr. Paradise, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, great. Hang on just a second. Uh, let's see. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, and, you know, when I was thinking about this uh, presentation, uh, I really had a chance to reflect on my, uh, pretty much my entire career as a professor. Uh, because I started, started thinking about, well, what have I done in terms of adventures in the field? Yeah, I'm a field biologist, but uh, I tell my students that I'm uh, somewhat of a fair weather field biologist. Um, and I say that because uh, when you're out looking for insects, terrestrial insects, you can't really go out in the rain or in the snow. And I don't travel much. Uh, although I have, but I, I don't travel for my research. And so I thought, well, I really don't have many adventures. But then I started thinking about uh, the sort of sum total of everything that I've done and decided that um, you really can make uh, a, a difference for students interested in field work just uh, locally uh, around either on campus or in field sites uh, that are nearby campus. And so that's what I decided to, uh, to, to uh, address today uh, because, uh, and I don't know if there are students in the audience, I hope there are, but uh, you know, uh, opportunities to do research as an undergraduate uh, are really important in terms of learning uh, how to do science and uh, preparing you uh, for uh, opportunities or experiences after college. Okay, well, hopefully you'll pick up on some of that, um, some of the, these um, opportunities that I talked, that I'll describe that, have, that I've given to my students over the years as we proceed. But I thought I would first uh, tell you a little bit about myself. So, um, and, and this is all part of that uh, reflection of, of my life and my career. Uh, so I'm a first generation college student. I'm from originally from Albany, New York, uh, way up north. And I was a biology major. I knew I was gonna be a biology major when I was in fourth grade in elementary school. I was always interested in bio. That was never a question for me. Um, and I got involved in an undergraduate research project through a friend of mine that I actually went to high school with, uh, this fellow right here, Jonathan Newman, who you can see, let me see if I can find him right here, find my pointer. Uh, and he got me involved in helping him with this project. And I didn't know anything about research, but he said, you know, do you wanna, th this is a course that you can take. And I had no idea that that was a possibility. So I took the course and I worked on a gray squirrel foraging project and, a, and then the following semester continued uh, working on foraging of dark-eyed juncos. And uh, I got listed in the acknowledgements, which to me was a huge deal. I had no idea about uh, scientific publications. And so this is the first time in 1987 that my name appeared in print. So of course I was super excited as, a, as, a, as an undergraduate. Well, after getting that sort of um, research bug, I then went to um, grad school. I went to, to the State University of New York at Binghamton, 
Oh, and, and in Albany, I was at uh, State University of New York at Albany. Then I went to Binghamton for my master's degree where I did laboratory research. So I won't really be talking about that, but I studied uh, praying mantis feeding behavior uh, when exposed to toxic prey. Uh, then from there, uh, I had a, a brief uh, period of, uh, after I graduated of unemployment and then very brief, thankfully, then I got hired by uh, Penn State University and I worked there for four years as the laboratory coordinator for introductory biology. So that's where I learned uh, a lot about uh, pedagogy and um, developed an interest in, in teaching. So I stayed there at Penn State for my doctoral degree and uh, worked on uh, uh, more of a field-based research. I studied tree hole community ecology. Specifically, I was looking at this uh, acid rain gradient that goes across the state of Pennsylvania, looking at whether or not uh, this gradient was affecting uh, communities of insects in these little water-filled uh, rot holes and trees. And so that was kind of how I made my, uh, uh, made my name in, in field biology in terms of developing uh, a project uh, or a, a research program that could include uh, undergraduates and was a model system that was fairly easy and tractable to manipulate and study uh, in a variety of different places. Uh, after, uh, after Penn State, I went two years, for two years I was uh, uh, teaching at King's College in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And that was mostly a teaching gig, so we're not gonna talk about that. And then after that, moved south down to uh, Davidson. So I've been here at Davidson ever since. This is my 21st year. Sometimes when I put up that number, uh, I'm shocked at how long, how quickly time has flown and uh, how I am, uh, how I've been here uh, for as long as I have been. Uh, I'm not only a biology professor, I'm also a professor in the environmental studies department. Uh, I study community ecology, uh, entomology and applied ecology. Those are my areas of uh, research. And then I teach a variety of courses that are related to those particular topics. As I mentioned earlier, I've really um, tried to give students uh, as many opportunities as I could. And at one point after I finished uh, the tree hole community ecology work, or I took it as far as I was willing to take it, um, I started to let students uh, choose the research. And that's why I call it student-driven research. So I would often have students come up to me and say, I wanna do research on this, or I'm interested in this, and how can I uh, get involved in, in research? Uh, and, and that's really, and that's actually even started before I finished the tree hole uh, community ecology work, uh, but it really has made a, a huge difference uh, for me in terms of getting me involved in projects that I never thought that I would get involved in. Uh, and, and it all be, you know, grows out of a conversation I have with a student who's interested in doing research. So I'm gonna tell you about some of those as we go, as we go along. Uh, but this, these are, the, are just a few of the projects that I've done over the years. Uh, well, it's probably the, the bulk. There are some other ones that I've done um, that I'm not going to talk about, but these are some of the ones that I thought would be of interest uh, to you all and have some um, minor adventure components attached to them. Okay, so uh, so tree holes. What is a tree hole? Well, a tree hole is a, uh, is a rot hole. It's a, uh, in a tree that fills up with water and a variety of different insects can live in them. And so for my graduate work uh, at Penn State, I was mostly working solo. So I did a lot of, um, of work out in the field by myself and ran into uh, a variety of small mammals, uh, skunks and deer, uh, never ran into a bear, 
although uh, bears have attacked uh, some of my um, some of my research equipment over over the years. Uh, but so on the left here, what you see is an artificial tree hole, uh, also sometimes called a, a mesocosm. Uh, uh, mesocosms are used in community ecology for a variety of different purposes. These are small. Uh, you might call them microcosms, except they're about the same size as a tree hole, which is why I call them uh, mesocosms. But basically, they're, it's a PVC pipe uh, that has a bottom on it and then an open uh, at the top and then surrounded by uh, expandable polyurethane foam, which I then encase in a PVC pipe frame, attach it to a tree, and then I surround the whole thing with uh, chicken wire to, to protect it. And uh, the great thing about this and, um, and why it's important to show this is because these things allow researchers to uh, manipulate the community. So I can put in whatever I want into, the, into these containers and then let them be colonized uh, by mosquitoes and uh, a variety of other insects that live in these uh, habitats as larvae. Uh, so one of the, pro so, so here are some things to watch out for when you're doing this kind of work. Uh, well, certainly poison ivy. So there was one time when we were uh, sitting in the woods after we had extracted all the, um, all of the components of the contents of a tree hole and we were counting the number of mosquitoes in the habitat. And one of my students um, meant, said to me, you know, Dr. Paradise, you're sitting in a patch of poison ivy. And uh, so that's like one of the dangers. But luckily, luckily for me, one of the best things about, about me being a field researcher is in, in North Carolina is that uh, I'm not sensitive to poison ivy at all. So uh, I, I had no, there was no, no problem sitting in a patch of poison ivy. Uh, but there are some other things that you might run into. I mentioned skunks and deer and bears. Uh, occasionally we'll run into a copperhead. Rattlesnakes, I've seen, um, stepped over one while I was walking through the woods in Pennsylvania one time. And then of course, lots and lots of mosquitoes. Uh, so those are some of the uh, things to watch out for. Uh, these are some of the students that have worked with me over the years. Um, and I'll mention uh, some of them uh, as we go along. Uh, Nicole was one of the first ones that on the right here that worked with me on tree hole stuff. And then Jess uh, here and then and Leslie. Uh, Jess went on to become uh, a lawyer. She does environmental law and Leslie has a uh, PhD in uh, oceanography. So I'll talk about them in, in, again a little bit. Well, one of the studies that we did uh, was a long-term examination of interactions in unmanipulated tree holes. So along the way, I'll, I'll talk about the projects and then I'll sh sometimes show you a little bit of data. So this was a, uh, in these unmanipulated tree holes, one of the ways that we looked at and divided up the data was whether or not the uh, habitat contained at the time one of the, uh, uh, at least one individual of the top predator, the species uh, that I'll show you in the next slide. And so the, um, so the open circles here are, uh, uh, indicate the average number of species in tree holes with the top predator. And then uh, the closed circles are ones without. So what we see here, what we found was that uh, there were more species in the tree holes when there was a top predator present and yet there were fewer of them. So the density, the overall density of this, of the uh, other insects, the prey insect species was lower, uh, which made us think that this predator may actually act as a keystone predator. Uh, so the next step then was uh, for Leslie, who I mentioned before, to do a manipulative experiment. She led that experiment. That was her uh, honors thesis. But all of the students, all of the co-authors on this paper, any, anyone with an asterisk is a Davidson College undergraduate. But then uh, Katie Hawkins was um, a, an undergraduate at another university who I hired uh, 
to come in and give her that experience. And then uh, Tyler Krentz actually was a high school student. He was the son of a colleague of mine in another department who was interested and, uh, and he basically worked for free. Uh, and, and then Sean Villapondo was a student who had just graduated from uh, University of North Carolina in Charlotte. And he went on to App State. Uh, but then of the Davidson students, let's see, uh, John Burkhart, um, Leslie Smith, Lauren Harshaw, all now have PhDs. Uh, Jared Blue, uh, I got a master's degree and then I think he went on to, uh, to law school. And then uh, Justin Goldberg, Ben Kidding Kittinger, both went on to med school. So uh, again, this is, shows you that, um, I mean, it's not that if you don't do research, you can't be successful, but all, almost all of the students that have worked in my lab have gone on uh, often to either med school or uh, to grad school or sometimes other professional schools. Okay, so Leslie did this experiment. This is the predator here, Toxorhynchites rutilus. And it's a mosquito that eats other mosquitoes as uh, larvae. Uh, so um, what we found in this manipulative experiment was that there was no relationship between the predator presence and species diversity. So at least in that manipulative experiment, we did not find evidence that the predator was uh, acted as a uh, keystone uh, species in tree holes, even though they can seriously depress the densities of a variety of different prey species. Okay, so uh, another project that we did uh, around that time was, um, was, well, a variety of different studies that I've done over the years on stream ecology. Uh, the first one that I did with uh, these two students, Maury Gage and Aaron Spivak, uh, has been published. It was published back in 2004 and uh, this just, so she's here collecting a suspended sediment sample uh, in the stream. And then these are a bunch of, this is a sample that we took a picture of that had a whole bunch of different insects in it. Uh, you know, what are the, what are the um, uh, potential hazards or risks when you're out doing stream work in urban streams? Well, we found a lot of ticks uh, while we were out there in the, in the riparian zone. And then, you know, citizens, um, not really a risk, but always very curious as to what we're up to. Uh, potentially cranky landowners and then leaky boots. Those are the things that you have to watch out for in terms of adventure, field adventures. Uh, so uh, this was, a, 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 I think, a, a fairly important paper. We looked at nine different streams and we classified them uh, pick them and classify them based on their on disturbance to the stream, either disturbance in this right in the stream or um, uh, disturbance in the watershed around the stream. And what we found was that the number of of insects, the aquatic insects that we found, was higher in low disturbance streams, uh, and that included what we call the EPT taxa taxonomic groups. Those are the um, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. I'll show you a little bit more of that in the next slide. Uh, and uh, family level diversity was also higher in the low disturbance stream. So we have a pretty clear relationship between the level of disturbance and the community of insects that uh, we would find in those streams. And we did find a little bit of a relationship here in terms of uh, the, uh, the diversity of insects uh, was higher in streams that were in areas, uh, in watersheds that had less, a lower percentage of developed land in that watershed, okay? And you can see these are all, of, of these four streams, three of them are the low disturbance stream. One of them is one of the irregular disturbance streams. Some of those streams uh, either had construction on or right in the, like right across the stream where we were studying it or may have dried up or, you know, different, there were different things that happened to the streams that made us classify it as uh, irregular disturbance. 
and I can answer questions about that if you have them at the end. Uh, but then what we found in terms of the, of the sensitive taxa, the EPT taxa, stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, uh, all of them are negatively impacted by disturbance. And so, uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily matter whether it's irregular or high disturbance, you see uh, that the abundance of these taxonomic groups drops pretty quickly and um, to, to a large degree and the diversity declines as well. Uh, so that, so we've continued to do some stream studies and from that uh, I actually developed a, uh, a, a laboratory activity or field activity for my ecology class. So one of the things that I like to do is to take this research that I'm doing with my students, bring it into the lab so all students in the class can have this uh, opportunity to, uh, to do some research. And so, uh, you know, because I had the protocols developed and I knew the streams, I had access to a lot of the streams, we could go out there and do uh, more of these studies or collect more data. And so here are some, some of the students from, oh, I think this was when I taught the course back in 2002 or three. Uh, one person I'll note here is uh, this woman here is Christine Grayson, uh, who is now associate professor at the University of Richmond. So, and she's an ecologist. So uh, I always, I take every chance, when whenever I see her, I take every chance I can to remind her that she took ecology with me. So, <laughs> right, uh, anyway. Uh, uh, so here, you know, a variety of students doing a, uh, different things and I would take them on, uh, you know, field trips and we would get out into the, into the field and learn how uh, to study streams. Now I've also done this in what we call here at Davidson, a group investigation. So these are small enrollment courses, maximum enrollment of six students. And when I, ha when I teach one of these classes, I'll break up those six students into uh, three groups, three pairs, and they'll each work on a different project. Uh, one year when I taught it, I think this was in 2009, uh, these two students worked on a stream uh, assessing uh, diversity of insects in a, uh, in, a in a stream that was undergoing a stream or had undergone a stream restoration project. So we wanted to know, uh, does, uh, this, uh, does this restoration process have any uh, beneficial in, impact on uh, the insects? And we had fortunately, bef before the restoration project, I had another student who uh, had collected some data along this very stream. So we had a comparison to, um, to, to base this on. Well, basically we didn't find, uh, find much in terms of any changes from one time point to the other. Uh, so these two students uh, did research in the context of that course. And uh, let's see, Kevin on the left here is now a staff member at the college. He works in, the, in donor relations. And Tanya, uh, I believe, went on to med school. Uh, another pair of students worked on uh, forensic entomology in that same group investigation. So this is a different project that some students had been interested in. And so we had, uh, so we used these uh, fetal pig carcasses, we put them in cages, and then we investigated the rate of decay and ecological succession of insects that, um, that colonize uh, dead animals under different conditions. So we could, uh, we had some that were buried, uh, some that were wrapped up in cloth, just like, you know, to, to determine uh, whether or not different conditions affected uh, the rate of decay of the carcass or which species colonize. Here we see some, uh, some beetles that have uh, colonized the, the carcass, but often you get blowflies and lots of other things. And, you know, this is what, on the right is what it looks like at the end of the experiment. So, you know, this again, this we did this in on campus. Uh, the north uh, 
There's about 100 acres or so at the north side of campus that the college owns that we've set aside as an ecological preserve. So we do a lot of research out there. Um, and so it's pretty safe, not much in the way of risk. Uh, the biggest uh, issue for this particular project was the smell of the rotting carcasses, as you might imagine. Uh, and then uh, one of the other studies that we've done, so I had another student who came to me and was interested in studying uh, farms, uh, insect diversity on farms. And so we decided to work with uh, uh, of several different farmers. We contacted them, they allowed us to work on their, on their land and we did uh, uh, an assessment of beetle and bug diversity in cattle farms that had different management practices. So they, uh, they allowed, they had different rotation of their, uh, of the cows in different farms and or different fields. And so they would let their grass grow to different heights uh, at, um, you know, different for let grow for, excuse me, uh, let them grow for different uh, lengths of time. They had varying cattle densities and they also had varying uh, surrounding land uses. So we looked at all that to see how it affected the beetle and bug diversity. Uh, probably a, the biggest adventure there was um, at this one farm here, the, this particular breed of cattle, which I can't uh, recall off the top of my head, they're very curious uh, animals. And if you're in the same field as them, they see you, they're gonna come and check you out. So there was one time when my students, uh, according to them, they got chased off the field. I was not with them at the time. Um, and they had to run and, and jump the fence. Um, I don't know exactly what happened, um, but uh, that was the story. And then there was another time where uh, I, was with, I was out there with two students and we got completely surrounded by these cows uh, and they were just very curious and we couldn't really move because they were all, they could completely surrounded us. So the, uh, the uh, farmer eventually saw us and uh, came and rescued us. <laughs> so that was a fun adventure. Uh, now, the other issue with the cows is that when we, we were using uh, pitfall traps and so pitfall trap is just uh, basically think of a solo cup that you dig a hole and you just uh, you, you can use a, um, one of those uh, tulip bulb planters and you dig out um, the soil and you put the cup in so that it's flush with the surface. And then uh, right here, we have these little uh, wooden dividers that uh, the insect would be walking along. It would hit this barrier and then it would turn left or right instead of crawling over it. And if it went to the right, it would walk and fall right into the cup. And um, we had to cover them with these, uh, this is like a, a kind of a siding, really hard uh, um, siding. It's not made out of wood, it's some, some other kind of material, artificial material. And this was the only thing that we found that uh, the, the cows, if they stepped on them, they of course uh, ruined the trap for that day, but they wouldn't actually punch down into the pitfall trap itself. This would stop them. So this was the, the best protection that we had. Um, and, you know, if we didn't use these, then we wouldn't have been able to do the experiment. So ultimately we found, I'm not going to show you uh, any of the data, but what we the major conclusion is that the sward height, which is the height of the, of uh, the vegetation and the land cover patterns were uh, were related to the insect uh, diversity patterns. Uh, so in terms of land cover in surrounding land, it's important uh, if you're thinking about agricultural practices on farms that might enhance biodiversity, um, you may be hampered by the uh, land use patterns uh, that surround the farm itself. Okay. Uh, a, a project that we did that was right on uh, campus, and this one, we actually just walked right out of the science building and 
used trees that were uh, right on campus. So it was like, it was literally a 10, 10 meter walk uh, to get to the first, uh, first tree. Uh, there are these, uh, I don't know, do y'all have uh, canker worms where you are? Do you, John, do you know? No, okay, no, okay. So canker worms are, um, they're, they're little, they're inchworms. Y'all know what an inchworm is. Uh, canker worm is, a, uh, there are two species of canker worms that uh, are found in the Eastern US and they can be are mo often in the Southeast and they can be what we call eruptive. So they have sort of a boom and bust cycle. They grow to really large population sizes and then they disappear uh, for a few years. Well, uh, this explosive growth in the Davidson area prompted uh, the banding of trees to uh, protect the trees from uh, defoliation. And so we were monitoring canker worms and what we noticed that was that we saw lots of other uh, arthropods, uh, spiders, and, uh, and other insects on these sticky tree bands. So we did a study on the accumulation of non-target uh, arthropods on these bands. So uh, this is a, a picture of one of the bands. And the way it works is that the, the, fem that the, uh, the caterpillars, they live up in the trees. When they're done growing, they drop down to the ground and they pupate in the soil, and then they come out either in the fall, if they're late fall, if they're the fall canker worm, or they come out in the spring, if they're the spring canker worm. Those are the two species. The females are wingless, and so they have to crawl up the tree to get up there to mate and lay eggs. And uh, that's why the band is effective, because it traps the females. And so I don't know if you can, how well you can see it, but all these little, almost all of these things are canker worm adults. And the ones that appear wingless, that, like these ones that I'm trying to circle here, those are the females. And then you can see some like up here uh, that have wings. And so those are the males. The males come because the females emit a pheromone and uh, the males then are attracted. They land on the band and then they're trapped as well. So uh, it can be a very effective uh, tool, but what we found was that if you put them, if you put the bands up too early in the fall, uh, then it can accumulate a lot of non-target insects. And if you put them up too late, then some of the females may have already gotten to the top and that could be enough to uh, produce uh, a large number of, of larvae, that, uh, caterpillars that would then uh, defoliate your tree. So the timing is essential. This is what they can do. Uh, these are all relatively minor uh, levels of defoliation, but this is the kind of damage that you can see on a variety of, of leaves here. And then this, these are some pictures from our study. Uh, we, were, we were actually using uh, photography. We we're using um, uh, digital uh, photography taking pictures of the bands and then analyzing them in the lab. And then we, that way we could actually track individual insects. Uh, if it's trapped on a band one time, it might be gone the next time because it got picked off by a bird or something. Uh, and so then we could actually get a really good handle on the uh, rate of accumulation, even accounting for any um, individuals that, were, that had been lost or removed from the band. Uh, but in addition to the insects that accumulate, you also get accumulation of leaf litter that is falling from the trees or gets blown up by a leaf blower and stuck to the band. And all of those things reduce the effectiveness of the band. So if you put it up too early, then you get all this other stuff on there and then that creates a lot of um, issues uh, and it creates pathways that the um, that the canker worms, the females can, can cross. It's basically a bridge that they can crawl over to get to the top of the tree. So here's a little bit of data. We found that uh, overall, so if you look at the top trace here, these are, this is the total arthropod accumulation uh, on these tree bands. I think we did 10 or 12 different trees that we were uh, watching over time. Uh, and you can see that there's pretty much a steady accumulation of non-target uh, arthropods on these tree bands. And we also have 
an accumulation of leaves on the tree bands as well uh, over time. Uh, more recently, I've been interested in uh, using digital macro photography uh, to look at pollinators. So here's another uh, student driven uh, project. So I had a student, uh, in this case, it was uh, Keiki Worthington, who came to me and said, I want to do a project on uh, pollinator diversity in local parks. And so we designed this experiment. And because of the of the decline in pollinators uh, globally, we tried to use um, to, to develop a non-destructive method to assess pollinator con communities. And this publication here in American Entomologist outlines that, uh, that approach, that particular uh, approach, which is basically a, a transect walk where we walk and take pictures of, um, of the insects, the pollinators as we go. And one of the great outcomes of this project is uh, I've developed an interest in, in insect photography. I'm not that good at it, uh, but, and, and all of these pictures uh, have been taken by, the, by the, my students. So my students are actually better at it than I am, but these are some of the, uh, a couple of bumblebees, and then there's a, a carpenter bee up here on this thistle. Uh, so uh, here's uh, Keiki with the, with the uh, camera. So she would walk the transect and I would point things out and she would uh, take pictures. Now what we have here is a, a camera that has a 180 millimeter macro lens. So you can take pictures of really small things from pretty far away. That way you don't have to get too close and scare off the, the bee or the butterfly. And so that allowed us to get pretty good pictures. Then of course, when you zoom in on those high res uh, images, you can still see how clear they are. Uh, this is Corinne on the right here on the, in, in this picture here. She's recording observations that uh, Keiki and I are calling out. And she also has a net in case we see something that we don't get a picture of, then we can try to uh, capture it and, um, and then take a picture of it and then release it. Now we also did, uh, in this experiment, we also did sweep netting. And we did this to determine the effectiveness of the, of the transect walk that we had developed. And so here's just a couple of pictures of us out in the field showing uh, Corinne how to identify something, whatever that was, I don't know, uh, looks pretty small on the end of my finger there. And then uh, here's a couple, I'll show you a couple of pictures just for fun here. Uh, th here's a pair of uh, mating eastern tailed blues and here are some other butterflies. The butterfly pictures all were taken by Corinne. She was in charge of butterflies. Keiki was in, in charge of uh, wasps and bees. And then other pollinators we ignored for this particular study. Uh, so here's a few of the, of the outstanding uh, images that we got from that study. And then this is some data that we published in that American entomologist uh, study showing the effectiveness of this uh, method. And basically the effectiveness is defined as the number of bee and wasp species found in the transect walk divided by the total number that we found using both the modified walk and the sweep nets. So we found on average or a median effectiveness of, um, of over 90%. Uh, I'm going to skip this except to say that we did find some relationship to in this study, we were looking at not only um, what the relationship to floral diversity, but also to um, the surrounding land use around the park because parks are preserved land, but they're often in a sea of developed land. And so we found some species were sensitive to uh, residential development. Uh, some in a positive way, like this species of bumblebee, and then some in a negative way, like the eastern tailed blue. Uh, here's a couple pictures of bumblebees, two species that we found. Uh, this one, Bombus impatiens, the eastern uh, common bumblebee, is the most uh, common. Uh, and then finally, I think this is the last one. Um, I had another student, Nick DeMassimo, came to me 
he's an environmental studies major and, and environmental studies majors have to do a capstone project. And so he came to me and he said, I'm really interested in, in uh, light pollution, the effects of light pollution on um, organisms. And so me being an entomologist, I said, well, we, if we do this, we have to do it with insects. And so we um, created these uh, light traps. So this is just basically a UV light that hangs in front of a white sheet. We set it up in the evening and then we come back at uh, one or 2 a.m. and we use the, uh, again, using the, uh, the camera, the digital imaging, take pictures of the traps and then we can have that. And then that's our evidence of uh, the different species that accumulated at those traps. So adventures there are things like, well, seeing things that I've never seen before because I'm never out at 2 a.m. So there are um, insect species that I wasn't even aware were in our area because I don't collect at that time of night. So that was pretty cool. But, you know, big disruption in my sleep all summer long. Uh, uh, but I think my body got used to it at some point. Uh, being stopped by campus police, that happens occasionally uh, when the students are out late at night. And then of course, Sometimes, very rarely, we get the traps uh, knocked over. One time it looked like it was a deer uh, that had done it. Um, and then another time we think it was uh, some students that were stumbling around at uh, late, late in the night or early in the morning. Anyway, that's a paper that uh, we have almost ready to go. We're gonna submit it this summer. Um, and so that'll be another, uh, uh, publication. And let's see, so some of these students uh, are still actually students. Um, and that's how recently this has been done. And here's a couple of pictures. So, so I don't know, I, I know Caroline is going to, uh, going to go to uh, med school, Louisa is going to go on to grad school. Uh, and I'm, and I'm not sure what Isaac and, and Nick are doing. And Lale is uh, still uh, I think she's only a sophomore still, or maybe she's a junior. Anyway, um, you know, still maybe too early to tell. So here's what some of the pictures look like of the insects. Uh, and then here's uh, sort of the major takeaway, major finding uh, that what we found was that on cool nights, we saw fewer insects. So, and so we, re we regressed the abundance of insects uh, against temperature. And what we found is that, not surprisingly, there were more ac insects active uh, at warmer temperatures, but at the dark field sites, the increase in activity uh, was uh, nearly exponential. It was at much higher rate than the increase in activity of insects at the lit sites. And so overall, we have uh, sort of larger uh, more abundance, more activity of insects uh, in those dark areas on campus. And that's mostly due to a bunch of insects that we really had trouble identifying. We call them small unidentified insects. That pattern uh, was seen with those insects. Uh, we uh, saw some consistency. This is, we, you often need to do long-term uh, collection of data to, um, when you're doing field work. Uh, in order to determine the pattern. So we did it two summers in a row and then one fall uh, semester we did it. So we saw somewhat similar patterns in the summers, a little bit different in, uh, in the fall in terms of what we saw, but there's still some variation uh, even uh, in the summer. So for, for instance, rove beetles, which are uh, in, in this case, small uh, uh, predators, uh, were more abundant at the dark sites, but then we had a very uh, big increase from one summer to the next. And so uh, while we see some consistency in pattern, there is variation from year to year caused by, uh, we don't know what, probably uh, variation in, um, in climate is what our suspicion is. Anyway, uh, so that's my story uh, and a bunch of, of of um, projects that I've done over the, over the years. 
And, uh, you know, this is just to sort of summarize and tie back into what I was talking about at the beginning. Um, I went from, uh, sometimes when I think about it, I'm, I'm kind of, I surprise myself. I went from being a first generation college student without so much as a clue as to what research was to now being a mentor to uh, dozens of students over the decades. And so I've, I feel like I've made a pretty good career out of creating these uh, adventures uh, in field biology using just uh, local uh, field sites, places that you could get to uh, in a short order. And I think um, it, I think it does make a difference in terms of uh, the student experience in getting those uh, research uh, opportunities, uh, especially the field work and going from an idea to, uh, to publication. And uh, so it's been my pleasure talking to you. And now uh, we have time for questions, right? Thank you very much, Dr. Paradise. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open the floor for questions. Uh, so if you have a question, remember you can ask in the chat or you can unmute yourself. So go ahead. somewhat of a more random question, I guess. Um, and this is about, I think you said this was one of the first projects you were involved with was the praying mantis versus mm -hmm. toxic prey. Um, right. Can you talk a little bit about that project in specific? Uh, were you still a student at that point? Uh, I was a grad student doing my master's degree. Yeah, and, and, and so, what do you want to know? Like big takeaways? Like what, what did I find? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just genuinely curious. And I know if, sure. if there are other questions, uh, you can keep it brief for sure, yeah. but just sure. overall. Sure. Uh, so the, the particular prey item that I was using, the type of prey uh, is a milkweed bug. And those have the same toxins in them as monarch butterflies because they feed on milkweeds. Uh, and we know that vertebrate predators uh, can be uh, affected negatively. Like uh, there's this famous picture of a blue jay eating a, a monarch butterfly in one picture. And then the next picture is it's throwing up the milkweed. So the, the compounds that are in the, that are uh, consumed and then sequestered by the monarch caterpillars and the milkweed bugs is uh, a medic. That is, it causes you to throw up. But we don't know what it does to insects, to insect predators. And so that was the, the idea of the study. But I also exposed them as juvenile uh, predators uh, uh, early in their development to see how it affected their growth. And so eating a diet of uh, of this toxic prey can reduce growth rates. And so they, so then they become smaller. And if they're smaller adults, especially if they're females, then they won't be able to produce as many uh, eggs. Uh, we know that fecundity, uh, the number of eggs is related to body size in, uh, in insects. Uh, but they also uh, have somewhat, they have some ability to learn uh, not great, uh, but they have some sort of more short-term, their, their short-term memory is better than their long-term memory in terms of, of um, overriding that instinct to, to attack anything that moves, right? So, um, so those are a couple of the, of the things that I remember. This was, remember, this was, uh, this was a lifetime ago, Lainey, when I did this, these studies. <laughs> Very interesting, um, mm -hmm. especially with the, the body size, the impact that it has there. Thank you. Right. Sure. You're welcome. Happy to take other questions. Well, I have one. Um, so I, you mentioned all like your research is so fascinating. I love bugs. Um, so I, I guess I'm curious. I know your first experience with research was dealing with squirrels. How did you arrive to entomology. I know you in grad school, you studied the praying mantis, but yeah. was that like undergraduate 
a slow transition or graduate school? I'm just yeah. curious. Uh, it was more in grad school. When I was an undergraduate, I had no interest in working with insects whatsoever. And as I said, I didn't even really know anything about research. And so when I went to grad school, I didn't have a, a, a lab that I was going to work at in. I didn't know who's, you know, like some people when they go to grad school, they've already made an arrangement with a with a, uh, a supervising professor. I didn't do that. So my plan was to do a rotation in several different labs. And so the first lab that I worked in was the, uh, the lab of uh, Dr. Nancy Stamp. And uh, she was doing, she, she, uh, her main research was in plant herbivore interactions, but she had also become interested in the predators that attacked the, the uh, herbivores that she was studying. And so she said, well, why don't you do a project on predator prey interactions? And here's, you know, a, you can use praying mantis and here's a pot potential prey. So I never did the rotation because I, it worked out so well in that lab that I just stayed there throughout my master's. And that's how I got interested in insects because I thought, wow, that is so cool to study predator prey interactions, like right in the laboratory. And you have uh, large sample sizes uh, that you can get larger than you could get if you were studying, you know, vertebrates or whatever. And uh, yeah, and it worked out so well, I just stayed there. And then, you know, then I started taking courses in entomology after that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I, I just thought that was super awesome how you went from squirrels to bugs. I was like, wow, that's a quite the uh, 180. Um, <laughs> I have one more question. Sure. So I'm going to interrupt before someone else interrupts me. Um, you mentioned unique research projects presented to you by students kind of ideas. What What's maybe the most, I guess, outlandish or kind of ambitious uh, research project someone's presented yeah. to you? Okay, well, uh, so, well, maybe not the most outlandish, but the one that I was probably least qualified to supervise was uh, I had a student, I'm actually really good friends with this guy now. He was, a, he was one of my first research students. Uh, he's now a professor at Johns Hopkins. Um, uh, and he came to me, he's from, originally from Virginia Beach, and he and his dad wanted to, uh, to do some uh, oyster habitat restoration. So he wanted to study oysters and their feeding rates under different conditions. And I was the closest thing in the department to uh, an invertebrate biologist. So he came to me and I said, Dave, I have no idea. I don't know. I mean, I, t I was teaching invertebrate zoology at the time. So I knew a little bit about oysters, but I didn't know much. And I said, look, uh, and he said, you know, I, I know, I know a fair amount about oysters already. And I said, look, I can help you with the space design of the experiment, data analysis and all that stuff. But beyond that, I, uh, I can't really help you. So, uh, so he came in and he built this elaborate tank system that had flowing water and pumps and uh, to filter the water constantly because, you know, oysters are filter feeders. And so they need constant movement of the water so that they can feed and you know carried out an experiment and we analyzed it and uh, uh, but we never published it unfortunately his last name is love and my last name is paradise and wouldn't have been a great thing to have a publication by love in paradise but that never happened <laughs> that that that's awesome i love that well uh, I'm done with my questions, so I'll let uh, someone else ask one. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to do one more going once, going twice, three times. Anyone? All right. No, I've answered all their questions. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I am going to um, go ahead and acknowledge some people for today's presentation. Um, so uh, thank you again, um, Dr. Paradise. We This has been awesome. I had a really, really wonderful time, and it's just so fascinating. Um, again, 
Uh, I want to thank Lainey for putting uh, everything together. Uh, Dr. Rollins as well um, for assisting with that. Um, as far as other people, other acknowledgements, and I'm pretty sure I'm, am I sharing the right screen? Looks yeah. like it. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, I did want to make a shameless plug for next week. Uh, so everyone invite your friends, same time, same place. Um, we're having Dr. Andrew Steen from University of Tennessee. Um, give us a follow on uh, Facebook or Instagram. Uh, we would love that. Hit the like, hit the follow.